Great, thank you, and welcome everyone to the latest in our Your EMEA General Council webinar series. These webinars take place every two months. They're free of charge and they're specially tailored for our North American client base. And I'm, I'm the head of our EMEA General Council service, which allows you essentially to get most of your day-to-day -day, um, UK and European legal advice on a, on, on a fixed fee basis. And we're always very happy to discuss with any clients who aren't signed up to that, um, who may be interested. Um, uh, the, 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 the terms of it. And today we've got a really interesting webinar focusing on data privacy issues, background checks, and, and all of those sort of interrelated issues that can cause um, big, big concerns for, for North American businesses who are working in Europe. And I'm going to hand over now to my colleague Stephanie Creed, who's going to start talking about the principles involved when you're, when you're hiring people when you're, and when you're trying to do um, background checks and what you need to be aware of, because the system is very different to what you might be used to um, in, the, in the US and in Canada. Over to you, Steph. Thank you, Paul. So looking at data protection in the UK, the Data Protection Act governs the processing of personal data in the UK and applies to the recruitment process as much as to the employer-employee relationship. The label on the employment status or relationship is to a certain extent irrelevant. Where personal data is collected, stored or processed, the obligations under the DPA will apply and this will extend to all current and former applicants, employees, agency staff and contract staff and even volunteers and work experience placements. So, set out you'll see on the slide in front of you are the eight data protection principles that apply in the UK. And as you can see from what's there, it's mostly around processing and the way in which um, data is handled. So looking at um, pre-employment checks and a couple of sort of general principles to, to keep in mind, checks should really only be used where there are particular and significant risks involved either to the employer, clients, customers, um, or others, and where there is no less intrusive or alternative um, to, that, to that check. Key points to remember are you should be informing applicants what checks should will be carried out, what form those checks will take, and when they will be carried out. That should give applicants a chance to at least clean up any of their social media profiles, for instance, or alter privacy settings. Um, checks should only be undertaken at as late a stage as is practicable in the recruitment process. So once they've been shortlisted or selected. And um, applicants should be given the opportunity to comment and to, um, to give feedback in relation to any checks and information found. And that's to sort of get around any risk that the employer has relied on perhaps inaccurate information. Um, checks should only be used as a means of obtaining specific information to fulfill clearly stated reasons. It's not an opportunity for a fishing expedition, for example. It has to be um, particularly focused. And employers should really only be seeking information from reliable sources where it's likely that relevant information will be held. Any searches should be proportionate to the role involved. And for instance, more senior and public-facing roles are likely to require more detailed checks than those that are less, less senior and are um, less public-facing. Now, information gathered along with discussions about candidate suitability can be the subject of data subject access requests. You can see there on the slide there's a couple of examples of the type of checks, um, and it's worth noting that all of those will be considered personal information and are likely to be sensitive personal information. So have a think about the types of checks you're doing and carrying out, um, as you may not be comfortable disclosing to candidates that what information you have about them and where you have it from. It's really worth thinking about, if you're in the candidate's shoes, what you might think is acceptable in terms of background checks and searches. As a general rule, candidates are more understanding of criminal background checks, particularly where they can be justified, and less understanding of searches of social media, because such sites are usually seen as personal and not professional. So turning to have a look at different types of checks that are, are carried out as part of the pre-employment um, process. Online and social media searches are something that comes up quite regularly. As you'll, you'll all be aware, the internet has opened everything up, and with that comes quite a bit of risk from the employer's perspective. So a couple of th key things to keep in mind are that you shouldn't be relying on information from possibly unreliable sources, and social media is probably one of the most unreliable. Online profiles aren't always created or controlled by the person they appear to refer to. There may be other individuals, for instance, who share the name and or have control of that, uh, that profile. 
the key questions to be asking are, um, do you know, and that's the key word, know, it's the right person? Do you know that the candidate controls their own profile? And do you know that the profile gives an accurate representation of that candidate? You shouldn't also be using deception in order to gain access to an applicant's social media profile, for instance, by creating a fake identity and, and friending a candidate. It's really found quite a really sensitive way um, of getting information that can get you in trouble. You also shouldn't be asking applicants to provide their username and password in order to conduct a full review of their social media accounts. It's less common these days, but it still happens, and as an employer, it will not get you around the protection that you need to provide for data. So aside from the, um, the potential risk to the employment relationship, that kind of behavior is likely to leave you as an employer open to claims and liabilities as a consequence. From a practical perspective, it's likely to put other candidates off, but you also run the risk of obtaining information about protected characteristics such as age, sexual orientation, um, disability, race, and so on. Do remember that dis discrimination will apply throughout the whole of these, um, these searches, and discrimination laws apply generally across both recruitment processes and whilst you're an employee. And if an applicant is then subsequently to claim that the decision to hire them or not hire them was based on one or more of those characteristics, there is a risk of a discrimination claim there and it's harder to defend that where you have evidence that actually you did, did know about those protected characteristics because of the searches you've carried out. Another key area of searches that comes up on a regular basis is criminal records checks and right to work checks. Now, employers aren't released from their data protection obligations in respect of the right to work and criminal background checks. And this information is likely to be sensitive personal information Requests for criminal history should be made only to the DBS, that's the Disclosure and Barring Service, and only in respect of the applicant the employer intends to recruit. The underlying position is that as an employer, you're not entitled to request information on an applicant's criminal record without a reason for doing so, and you should only be requesting information to the extent that it can be justified in terms of the role offered. Um, you should be limiting the collection of information to offences that bear, have a direct bearing on the suitability for the role in question. So, for example, if the role involves financial responsibilities, you should be limiting it to simply convictions for fraud, for example. Do note that you can't ask for spent convictions um, unless the job is covered by the exceptions order. Spent convictions are treated differently and there may be additional sanctions separate and in addition to any data protection consequences. And as of March 2015, it's a criminal offence for an employer or prospective employer to force its employees or applicants to obtain a copy of their criminal record by means of a subject access request and then supply it to them. It's really a, a case for employers of getting a balance between getting hold of the information you need to hire the right candidate and compliance with the data protection obligations. The more you know, the greater the risk of breaches. Um, I'll now hand over to Paul to talk through the position in Germany. Thanks, Stephanie. With respect to data protection obligations, um, the situation in Germany is um, quite similar to the one in UK. Um, everything that has been said with respect to social media searches basically also applies um, to Germany. Although um, in Germany, uh, it is generally um, assumed that whenever you have a question about a candidate, you should rather contact the candidate directly and discuss your questions with him rather than um, trying to uh, gather information from third parties such as the internet. So uh, it would always be preferable to uh, contact the uh, job applicant directly. However, uh, we know, all know it's um, current practice to Google a potential job candidates and uh, to have a search on social media. If you do so, and basically uh, uh, unless you try to uh, befriend someone, uh, the risk that uh, someone finds out is, out is actually um, pretty pretty low. Um, but if you do so, in Germany we would distinguish between social networks that, are, um, that exist for, for leisure, for private purposes, such as, for example, Facebook, uh, where you uh, communicate with friends and family, and business networks such as LinkedIn. And with respect to business networks, usually uh, you would assume that um, research on business networks uh, would be uh, rather acceptable than research on uh, leisure networks such as Facebook. 
with respect uh, to criminal record also um uh, from a German perspective, you should only, uh, as an employer, ask for um, possible um, crimin criminal activities or sentences uh, in, in the past if they directly relate to the job that you're offering. So, for example, if uh, you're uh, looking for a bus driver, you may um, require information on whether uh, there was a drunk driving in the past. If you're uh, looking for IT staff or an accountant, uh, drunk driving is probably not so important and you would not be allowed to ask. Uh, in Germany, it is very, very unusual to require uh, criminal records or uh, some kind of pol police certificate. Um, and this would also be very problematic from a data protection standpoint as these criminal records would um, include all information on potential criminal activities in the past. So uh, it would basically be impossible to limit the information that is provided via such a cr criminal record. And so um, such criminal record should really be required only in very, very limited cases when, uh, when there is very good uh, argument to explain why such criminal record is needed. Also, it will be very difficult to achieve such a criminal record. Uh, there is no official authority that will hand it out to you in general. Uh, usually, you will have uh, to require that the job applicant will provide you with a criminal record. And as said, this is very unusual and is likely to raise concerns with the job applicant. If indeed you, uh, you have very good arguments to require such criminal record, um, you should uh, ensure that the access to such data within uh, the employer entity is limited. So only uh, the information should only be shared on a need-to-know basis and only uh, to a very limited amount of people. With respect to credit checks, the information or the, the situation is quite similar. Um, credit checks may only be done um, if they are uh, relevant for the role that is offered. So, for example, if you're looking for an accountant that uh, will have to deal with um, a substantial uh, amount of money or when you have a situation uh, where there is a, a danger of bribery, etc., um, it may be allowed from case to case uh, to, um, to have a look at uh, credit ratings, etc. But the information that, uh, that is to be requested should always be proportionate and it should rather be the exception than the rule uh, to, to request credit checks with respect to job applicants. Again, um, such credit check will, in, will include uh, quite vast information, uh, probably uh, in many cases scoring or information on uh, minor non-payments, maybe 20 euros or so that have been done in the past. All the information will be gathered, and for mo in most cases, this will just not be uh, reasonable anymore and will be uh, not uh, proportionate. Uh, apart from data protection law, we have a peculiarity in Germany, uh, uh, and we have a similar situation actually in France. Um, uh, the, we have a so-called works council, which is a representative uh, of the employees. Theoretically, it can exist in uh, all companies with more than five employees, but uh, generally you will find it in bigger, bigger uh, entities. And these work councils have quite strong information and co-determination rights. So with respect to quite a lot of uh, measures that you want to implement which uh, concern employees' rights, the works council either has to be heard or in many cases even has to consent uh, before the respective measures are implemented. Here, regarding credit checks, criminal records, etc., it may be relevant that uh, the guidelines for uh, the selection of employees, as well as possible assessment criteria and staff questionnaires um, will have to be dis discussed and consented by the Works Council before they are implemented. If, there is, uh, uh, if you disagree with the Works Council uh, on how, uh, how these guidelines shall be implemented, um, the Works Council cannot impede forever that you implement them, so he has no right to say no and just uh, stop the uh, respective implement, uh, implementation of guidelines, um, but you can go to a conciliation board to find a solution which will generally be reasonable. If, however, you implement measures before coming to a conclusion with the Works Council, the Works Council could theoretically, in the worst of all cases, um, 
go uh, to court and uh, file for an interim injunction which would uh, stop the measures uh, until there is a, a mutual solution found. And by saying this, I hand over to James, who can explain a bit about the situation in France. Thanks very much, Paul. So now we're going to give a bit of a flavour of what it's like in France, which I think, as Paul has intimated, is not entirely dissimilar to Germany. So the first point we're going to look at is pre-employment checks in France. And I think the core principle here is that employers can only obtain information about an applicant which allows an assessment of their professional skills in respect to that particular role to be offered. So it really has to be in relation to, to that particular role. Um, taking that on a bit, employers can only seek personal data, as you can see on the slide, from job applicants where there is a direct and necessary connection between the background check and what the employment relationship is envisaged to be. I think one of the key things to, to note in, in relation to France is that the French employers have to file a registration with and obtain prior approval from the French Data Protection Authority, which I've abbreviated there as the CNIL, which is the Commission Nationale de l'Informatique et des Libertés, um, and this is to collect the data sought on any background check forms used. Moving on from that to criminal record checks in France, um, the employer is it would be fair to say generally prevented from reviewing um, and finding, about, finding out about any previous convictions. Um, for the verification of criminal convictions, background checks are only permitted for certain, posi uh, certain positions and roles, which I think is something Paul uh, has mentioned in relation to Germany, and this would usually be in prescribed sectors such as banking, auditing and the defence sector. Um, what might usually happen in practice is that job applicants would, and it would be the job applicants themselves, they would be asked to apply for and produce a so-called certificate of good standing, which gives details of any conviction recorded in a central records bureau or states that there is no such conviction there. Moving on to credit checks in France, again, it's, um, there isn't really a, a great deal of leeway. There's, it's generally not permissible permissible, irrespective of consent obtained from a, from a job applicant to conduct credit checks. As you might expect, um, there are situations where an employer um, recruits for a specific job that does necessitate the collection of a particular type of information, um, but this will be in limited circumstances. And again, these permitted exceptions are within the, the banking, auditing and defence sectors. I think one of the key things to take away is that it's key for an employer to demonstrate a legitimate interest and require the applicant to provide this certificate of good standing. Moving on to online and social media searches, um, in theory I guess employers can make use of all internet information, whether it's on a professional network or a social media uh, network such as Facebook. but. Um, what an employer can only do is gather relevant information, which is to determine the capability of a prospective job hire. Um, and again, we get back to that point where there must be a direct link to the position in relation to the information sought. So it would be possible to use a search engine to research candidate and social media sites, but um, really this should be limited to professional networks uh, such as LinkedIn. Um, I think it's fair to say that non-professional networks would be deemed irrelevant uh, in this context, and it, you know, for example, there could be the, the danger that it can um, there's information on religious beliefs or sexual orientation, and you know, employees are quite aware, obviously, of what are on their pages, and you know, this could be um, an area that pr that brings up a discrimination risk in the recruitment process. So in France, again, uh, the concept of uh, a works council is present as it is in Germany. And again, one of the key things is that there must be consultation with the works council and uh, dealings with them, and they must be informed about any recruitment methods before um, before they are actually, before the actual uh, methods are implemented themselves. Um, and as I've just mentioned, in relation to online social media searches, employees are very aware of what on their what, what is on their pages. So beware of using. Uh, anything that you do find on there if you do use uh, those pages in a discriminatory fashion. We're now going to move on to the topic, uh, the general topic of monitoring, and I'm going to hand back over to Steph, who's going to cover employee monitoring in the UK. So turning back to the UK, um, why is it important to, to establish a sort of a culture of compliance in terms of data protection? Well, as you'll know, businesses can't constantly scrutinise and watch over their employees' and actions. 
it's not feasible from a practical perspective and it's not in the interest of efficiency or productivity. So in order to remain compliant, you need to build a culture of um, data protection and security. So some of the key things to consider to do that is, firstly, you'll need to look at exactly how the operational structure of your business fits with the data protection regime in the UK and consider what steps you as a business need to take in order to keep effective compliance. Now, basic DPA obligations apply to personal data and higher obligations apply when dealing with sensitive personal data. That can happen in a variety of circumstances, including dealing with customer or client data, handling data with other third parties such as contractors or suppliers, and processing personal data relating to staff members such as benefits, payroll, um, and internal HR and disciplinary records. It's important that you identify the situations where you'll be processing personal data and appreciate that the type of data being processed will vary and therefore the applicable protection measures that should be implemented will vary. You also need to consider looking at um, your business as a whole, potential restrictions on transfers of personal data even within the corporate group if these cross into jurisdictions outside the European data protection regime. There may also be a need for additional storage and processing facilities in certain jurisdictions um, as is likely to be the case in Russia, for example. Cloud storage also poses difficulties for compliance. Now, businesses that have located or outsourced certain aspects of operational structure to other jurisdictions, and that includes cloud storage arrangements, will need to ensure that their employees understand the applicable restrictions on transferring personal data in those regions. You will also need appropriate systems in place for regulating such transfers, and in the absence of such measures, staff may not appreciate the, the consequences of transferring data, especially when their own minds are effectively just sending an email to a colleague in a different country. It's particularly an issue for cloud storage and for centralized data storage systems where there is a multinational company. One of the key elements of building this kind of culture of compliance is training. And it's fundamental that the workforce really understands the, their obligations regarding data protection and security, not only for the business, but for them personally. And at the heart of this will be the, the data protection policy of the company. Policies should act as detailed guides explaining the responsibilities of the business and the individual in a manner that's clear, concise, and easy to understand. And these policies should be re reviewed and updated regularly to ensure that they're up to date, given that the, uh, the area is continuously changing. And as obvious as it may sound, it's also essential that employees actually read, understand, and implement these policies. It's best practice um, that policies are provided to any workers at the outset of their engagement. And again, good practice would be to ask them to sign an acknowledgement that they've read and understood the policy um, and their obligations under it. You should also, as a business, be providing initial training to, to your workforce regarding specific data protection risks and obligations and arranging for updates or refresher sessions where necessary. And given that particular concern, uh, considerations may vary depending on the part of the business, you may want to also provide role-specific training in certain areas, such as HR, for example, given the, uh, the nature of the work. Training should be maintained and resourced to keep both data protection at the forefront of employees' minds um, and also make sure that employees are aware of any developments. And a particular concern will be where you are routinely engaging agency workers or independent contractors, which is common in certain sectors. Um, consider how you will ensure that they know what their obligations are and how to make them aware and require them to comply. You might need to watch that in terms of their employment status and how you differentiate between them and other employees. Um, and again, your handbook should make clear that certain policies will apply to everybody regardless of their employment status and that doesn't necessarily give them corresponding employment rights. Another key component is systems and securities. Businesses are required to ensure that any personal data which they're processing is protected by adequate security measures, and that includes digital and organizational systems. Um, for data that's stored electronically, certain measures will consist of having firewalls, encryption, digital protection, and that's both in relation to data on your internal hard drive or servers and in relation to any data that on file transfer or email facilities used. For internal storage, think about where data is saved and stored. For example, will all computers be on a network? Will staff be encouraged to save data to the network or permitted to save to their personal drive, for example? Um, you also need to make sure that staff are aware of the need to follow and keep up security measures. 
and make clear about how you feel about the use of file transfer facilities. Personal emails, for example, again, will you let staff use them and will you make clear to them what the risks are in doing so? Guidance on the use of file transfer facilities and email systems should be in your data protection policy um, and you should be providing any initial training on that when people join your staff. You might want to think about implementing a standard document transfer procedure, including a preferred file transfer site, as this should reduce the likelihood of staff members using riskier methods, methods of data transfer. Um, particular consideration will be needed where you allow staff or you require staff to use personal laptops and other devices when working for, for your business and processing personal data. Businesses with home workers, flexible workers or remote workers are particularly at risk here given that there may be no home office or physical supervision. And in those circumstances you should be trying to identify the additional security risks involved and ensuring that adequate security measures are in place in respect of those devices. At a basic level, employees should be required to keep data physically secure, so to keep any laptop or documents in a secure location, not to leave a laptop or documents vulnerable to theft or distortion and so on, and also to protect the data and its location with passwords and other appropriate security measures. You may also want to provide for any remote access to company files to be restricted to online server access, or to provide for remote hard drive deletion in the event that devices are lost and stolen. And in addition to any software-based measures, you might also want to think about adequate practical and organisational uh, systems to protect personal data. Now, that could consist of providing employees with appropriate reporting lines for data protection queries or for suspected breaches. And you may find it appropriate or useful to appoint a specific data protection officer within your business to deal with queries and to manage communication with the ICO. Um, you, want, you will want to consider any powers that you have to monitor employee activity in general and any software or practical measures you can put in place to monitor and track transfer of data and processing. And given the risks associated with breaches and the speed with which information can be transferred or disseminated, you, you should be considering any relevant measures for enforcement and evidencing breaches. I'm now going to hand over to Paul to talk through your position in Germany. Thanks, Stephanie. When it comes to monitoring of internet and email accounts of employees, Germany is probably one of the most difficult markets to deal with. If the private use of the internet and email accounts is allowed, we have a very bizarre situation in place in Germany. In this case, not only data protection law applies, but basically the employer is considered to be a telecommunication provider, such as AT&T, for example, and basically offers internet and email services to his clients, the employees. This has the consequence that the employer must not uh, just review for or monitor, for example, the email user must not access uh, the email account of the employee, even if he has valid reasons. So even if the employee is sick and he uh, needs access to emails, and generally it will be forbidden to access respective emails. There may be workarounds in some cases, in particular if uh, it is assumed that the employee um, acts fraudulently or uh, has committed a crime and uh, the employer needs to access the email in order uh, to prove this. Um, but this, these, even these cases are very limited cases and there is no uh, safety that this can be done in compliance with uh, German law. So theoretically, if accessing the email account uh, when private use is allowed, then this might be considered a criminal offense. Accordingly, the German data protection authorities recommend not to allow the private use uh, of, of internet, telephone and uh, email. However, in practice, this is often not feasible because all uh, German employees are used to respective uh, permission to, to use the internet, uh, also at least for limited private uses. So uh, if you do not want to, rest to fully restrict uh, the private use of Internet and email accounts, you should at least uh, regulate it very well and um, achieve constant declarations of your employees that you have the right to access emails at least in certain limited cases. If the private use is forbidden or at least strictly regulated, this still does not mean that you can have access to, to the email account and respective Internet data uh, just as you like. 
uh, still the strict German data protection regulations will apply. Even if the private use is forbidden, you will generally only have access, for example, to the email account if there are valid reasons and uh, the access is proportionate and there are no uh, valid reasons or valid uh, grounds, uh, interests of the employee for the employer not to access such data. But in general, if private use is forbidden, it is much easier for the employer to have access to respective data. When it comes to monitoring phone calls, we have a similar situation. If the private use of uh, the, um, the business uh, telephones is allowed, then again the employer is considered a telecommunication provider and must not listen to any phone calls of the employee. But even if the private use is strictly forbidden and the employer also controls that this prohibition is actually enforced in practice, even in this case uh, it would not be allowed uh, for the employer, for example, to record uh, the, uh, the calls of his employee. So if he wants to do this, if he wants to record his uh, employee's calls, for example, um, because he has a call center and wants to do um, control for, for quality uh, or compliance purposes, he will have to announce this to his employees at least on a general basis. So he will have to say uh, within the next two weeks uh, we will have uh, uh, a monitoring in place of your phone calls. Please be aware of this. Also, this, this cannot just be done. Uh, uh, you cannot just give such a general information and then uh, say, please note that we can always record your phone calls. This won't be sufficient. You will, you will have to restrict it to limited time frames. Mm -hmm. When it comes to video monitoring, in general, you should restrict video monitoring to endangered places of the company and, as far as possible, try to avoid video monitoring of employees. So, for example, if you have a supermarket, it would be preferable to have, uh, for example, video cameras um, uh, filming the hall where the, the, the customers are in order to avoid uh, that customers uh, potentially steal any goods rather than having the cashers filmed because uh, the customers are in the shop only for a couple of minutes and the uh, impact to their privacy rights is low when you film them, them uh, with respect to uh, the employees. They are there uh, all day and you, uh, they will be uh, controlled uh, eight or ten hours a day. This is quite, uh, quite a big restriction of the privacy rights. In any case, uh, the video surveillance must be communicated transparently and be reasonable and proportionate. Only in very, very limited cases it will be allowed to have concealed uh, video monitoring in place. For example, if a criminal act um, is uh, specifically suspected and uh, there is no other way to uh, avoid this criminal act uh, rather than to use video surveillance. Again, uh, with respect to all these measures, uh, if a works council exists in a company, he will generally have uh, the right uh, to be informed about the implementation of respective measures and also uh, have, a, have a say in it. Um, this goes very far, uh, in particular with respect to the implementation of uh, hardware and software, for example, that is capable of monitoring. So basically every software that you implement uh, in a company, even if it is not directed at monitoring uh, employees and even if it doesn't monitor employees, the fact that it could theoretically be used to monitor employees, and this will be the case with, with basically any software because basically any software has some kind of logging possibilities, this fact that it could be used for monitoring will trigger already the co-determination rights of the works council and basically you will have to discuss the implementation of respective measures and generally achieve works council consent before you implement them. And by this, I hand over to James, who can speak about the situation in France. Thanks, Paul. So I'll, I'll just move very quickly through um, similar topics in France, and starting with monitoring internet and email accounts. Um, I think, again, one of the, the key points to mention to start with is that there is an emphasis on the, 
on an employee's right to their, to their private life and secrecy of um, the correspondence that they have in the workplace. Um, I'd also say at the outset that any employee monitoring technology that is used by employers must be notified to the Data Protection Authority in France and also uh, to those employee representatives. The surveillance of an employee's uh, email account um, without having a legit legitimate interest is likely to constitute a, bright, uh, a breach of this right of secrecy of correspondence. Um, Fair again to say that private emails can't be monitored, and any company policy which expressly permits, um, you know, searching uh, around private emails will not be enforceable. Um, after consultation with an employer's work committee about the terms of operation, which would um, detail and highlight what the legitimate interest might be, uh, professional emails can be freely searched unless emails are sent from a professional address but marked uh, or clearly marked personal. Um, I think it would be okay to, for recipients and senders of emails to be checked, but the actual content of, of the email should not be. Moving now on to the monitoring of uh, phone calls, uh, there has been a development in, in France actually in, in January 2015, so not all that long ago, um, and the French Data Protection Authority um, adopted what's, what they've called a simplified norm. Um, which addresses the processing of personal data in connection with the monitoring and recording of workplace telephone calls. What this essentially means is that there's a streamlined procedure for businesses in France to declare compl uh, compliance with call monitoring and recording. And the scope of this is um, in effect for, for matters such as employee training um, to, to improve employees' performance and the improvement of uh, the service quality that, that is given to clients. So. The periodic processing of calls would fall within uh, the scope of this so-called simplified norm um, and the, the simplified registration procedure can be used with the Data Protection Authority but um, if it goes beyond that and it could be within the permanent processing of calls, so listening to every call outside of that scope that I've mentioned, then a standard registration form would need to be filed with the Data Protection Authority and that would be a lot more onerous. So in France, I think um, just very quickly the key points to, to take away, as I've mentioned, businesses that do use employee monitoring technology, which would be which would be all nowadays, um, they need to notify the Data Protection Authority of the tools that are being used, um, and they also these tools must be communicated to the employee representatives in France. Um, there are consequences uh, for a failure to do this. Um, for example, information obtained from a data processing system before. Um, it's had clearance from the Data Protection Authority and um, could amount to illicit evidence and if it wanted to be used, for example, in a court case with an employee, this would not, in fact, be uh, admissible. Um, so basically, the Data Protection Authority should always be notified. Um, employees should be informed about the data processing systems which are in place. Um, and we'd also recommend on a practical level in France that IT uh, security policies are included as part of the company's rules. Um, and they're also perhaps run past the, the Data Protection Authority for a bit of extra um, comfort there. I'm now going to hand over to, um, to Vin Vange, who's head of the UK Data Protection Practice um, over here, and he's going to talk about data transfer and some developments in some upcoming EU regulation. Thank you. Stephanie's already talked about some of the issues uh, and some of the finer points around data exports. What I wanted to do just for a moment is to just take a slightly higher level look at data exports and, and why we have that issue and, and how to get around it. Um, in the earlier slides, we saw that there are eight data protection principles. Um, one of those principles, the eighth data protection principle, which reflects the requirements from Article 25 and 26 from the EU Directive, provides that data should not leave the European area unless the rights, the uh, obligations, that exist within the data protection law actually flow with the data. And the idea behind that principle is that within Europe we have this data protected zone. We have the directive and all the countries within Europe that have implemented the directive with their local laws which provide for the rights and obligations to protect the data and to place those obligations onto data controllers and organizations uh, in relation to observing those rights and the framework of obligations around how that data should be treated, handled, collected, processed, so on and so forth. 
So with that in mind and having this zone of data protection within Europe, the principle is such that if the data is then to leave Europe, then that protection, those rights and obligations should continue to flow with the data. Now we have to think back to when the directive actually was being debated, discussed and, and before it was finalized and came into force. And that's going back into the mid 1990s, perhaps even the early 1990s when the initial discussion started. And that's going back to the old days of computer bureaus and, and perhaps even very little um, being done in terms of offshoring and movement of data beyond jurisdiction. Of course, now and today the position is very, very different. Data exports are commonplace, but nevertheless still challenging to deal with as far as complying with the eighth data protection principle is concerned. Particularly for North American businesses that will have some form of presence within Europe, whether it's an affiliate or branch entity or, or whatever that entity happens to be, those operations within Europe will no doubt, in relation to the employer-employee um, environment, will be collecting data and therefore there will be applicable data protection laws and we've explored a lot of that in the webinar today. But what that does is it instills that obligation in relation to data exports. And if you are that North American business where the data that's collected and captured anywhere within Europe is then perhaps made accessible or is exported to service um, back at Global HQ, uh, whether that's a parent company in the US or wherever it ha happens to be, then you'll find that actually there's been that export of data. And the, 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 the data flow becomes more complicated these days because often you'll find that there may be other affiliates around the world that will be sharing that data. There may be providers, um, whether it's cloud providers, as Stephanie mentioned earlier, or other systems providers that are also in different locations around the world. And suddenly the flow of data becomes a very global picture. And it's important to undertake this data flow and data mapping exercise. Often we see so many organizations doing this on their customer side and looking at the customer data, but often neglecting to look at this from a HR data perspective. Because so often HR data is stored on your own systems, it's, let's say it's shared with affiliates, it's moved on to global HRM um, and talent management systems, for example, and within that third party process environment, and often supported from different jurisdictions. And you have to bear in mind how easy it is to trigger a data export scenario arising, bearing in mind that just accessing and viewing the data from another jurisdiction will amount to a data transfer and therefore a data export uh, under EU or applicable data protection law within Europe. So having described that there is this barrier of, of, of data export, um, you do need to have a solution to it and there are some solutions that are available. And there's a whole range of solutions which perhaps complicates the scenario a little bit further than it actually helps. Um, there are, for example, the so-called model clauses, the standard contractual clauses, which can provide a workable solution, particularly for bilateral data flows. So data being exported from uh, an affiliate entity in Europe to the parent company or the server location for the parent company, for argument's sake, in the US. However, model clauses, um, are often designed and were originally drafted with a bilateral nature in mind. So they're impractical for the dynamic data flow scenarios that we see today, although they still have much value um, in that data process or third party scenario. Indeed, they're often necessary to ensure that you're complying with the restrictions by having those in place for the third party and processor uh, vendor scenarios. Intragroup agreements based on the model clauses are often seen as a much more flexible and dynamic way of using model clauses and providing that better suited solution for internal data flows amongst all the affiliates and the global structure of, of, of your particular organization. Um, and often that allows for the multiple flow um, scenarios to be factored and, and built into that intra-group agreement um, and, and allow for that solution to, to, to be uh, put into place and legitimize that export of data. There are other solutions such as BCRs or binding corporate rules, which are at the moment very much seen as the gold standard 
but they do require significant resource and commitment to actually make sure they're put into place. You need to demonstrate that you have a robust program around privacy that can actually deliver that um, flow of obligations and rights that I mentioned earlier on. Um, there are some solutions you can adopt, such as anonymizing the data or masking the data in a way that it's uh, potentially de-scoped from the legislation, or perhaps even just keeping the data in country, which is never a complete practical solution, because often given the data flows and way global organizations work, it's just impractical to keep all data in country. But that might be a part solution in some cases. Consent from the individual is also a possible solution. Um, however, it's not a preferable solution. Um, there's so much commentary um, that has been around for a number of years now from various institutions within Europe, in particular the Article 29 Working Party, that has really cast a huge shadow as to whether or not consent in relation to data exports within the workplace environment is ever um, reliable as, as a viable solution for data exports. However, it can work in certain limited confined scenarios. For example, if you had a very small team which required a global export of the data that they handle, then you might be able to deal with the practical consequences of consent from that very small team. But again, that's the, that's the exception as opposed to the rule. In terms of exports, there are some countries around the world that are deemed to provide that adequate uh, degree of data protection. Um, however, the number of countries that have actually achieved that status are very few and far between. As far as North America is concerned, Canada is one, one such country. However, the U.S. does not have that status. And other countries which are seen as typical countries where HR data may be exported for infrastructure purposes, such as India, the Philippines, uh, South Africa, for example, um, do not benefit from that deemed adequacy decision. So you do need to look for the solutions that I've mentioned already in terms of model clauses, BCR, intricate agreements, and so on. In between Europe and the US, there is, of course, the US Safe Harbor solution, which is available. Uh, this is very specific to Europe and US, and it is a self-certification scheme However, it's one that's come increasingly under attack from many jurisdictions uh, around Europe. So there are concerns from many countries around Europe as to its validity. So it's difficult uh, from the perspective of uh, regulators in countries such as Germany, France, to a degree, the Netherlands, Poland, and Austria, um, that will recognize US safe harbor as the complete solution to legitimize the export of data from Europe to the US. So take care to rely on that as your sole solution. Um, the last point I just wanted to touch upon, and we will be looking at this subject in the months uh, to come, which is the um, proposed new EU framework on data protection. So we've talked a lot uh, in today's webinar about how data protection and data privacy impacts on the workplace and how that all stems from uh, an EU directive which has been implemented in each country across Europe to give you, uh, in effect, 28 different data protection laws that are based on a minimum standard, but of course all flex uh, and are interpreted in slightly different ways to give you that disharmonized approach that we have at the moment. There is a proposal that was originally published um, back in 2012, and if you're looking at your slides, that's not a typo, it was three years ago that the initial um, publication was released on the proposal. Um, and here we are some three years later where there's been much negotiation, much talk, much debate around when this law is finally going to be finalized. We now fully expect, having seen so much progress on this in the last few months and this year alone, that um, this new EU data protection regulation will come into force in January in 2016. Um, it's likely to come in with a two-year implementation period. Given the impact that it will have, I think many organizations will need the full two years to actually um, bring themselves in a position of compliance with the new regulation. So what is this regulation? Is it an evolution or is it a revolution? It's actually a bit of both. Uh, 
it will still contain the principles that we've explored in today's webinar, those eight age protection principles will still live through into the regulation, but you will see some upgrades on each of those areas. You're also going to see some new areas uh, and some new rights and some new obligations uh, that are going to be imposed by the regulation uh, as well. So there's a lot of new stuff in there which will have to be taken on board and complied with. Like many new pieces of law, um, it will inevitably be um, uh, full of uh, points of ambiguity. And if we were to look at the draft that we uh, have had since uh, 2012, and if we look at the movements that we've seen on the draft as it's been negotiated within different European chambers, there seems to be very little by way of clarifying some points of ambiguity. So don't expect when this regulation comes out uh, to see a very polished piece of law that provides complete clarity on what is required. Um, I still think there's going to be many points of ambiguity um, at which may lead to a lack of harmonization. So one or two of the fundamental points I just wanted to mention in relation to the regulation um, uh, before we wrap up today. One thing that is very new with the regulation is the current data protection law does not tell you how to comply. It does not tell you what compliance actually looks like. Um, the regulation, when it comes into force, will have quite a lot to say about documentation, about uh, compliance being a frontline obligation uh, with the potential to introduce a, a mandatory role of a data protection officer, and to also um, require tools of, of compliance which to date have not been legal requirements, such as privacy impact assessments, privacy by design, and also bringing into place requirements around a uniform data breach notification requirement, which will come with the obscenely short time scale of either 24 hours, or if we see some movement on that, it might move to 72 hours uh, from becoming aware of a data breach um, organ uh, event. The other major point to, 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 to highlight uh, before I wrap up is what happens when it goes wrong? If you fall on the wrong side of compliance with the regulation, um, many of the civil rights that we have at the moment will still live through into the regulation, we believe. But in relation to fines and financial sanctions, there is a huge sea change that's coming. So right now, um, regulators, for example, the Information Commission in the UK has the ability to issue a fine of up to half a million pounds, and that's so it's 500 pounds, 500,000 pounds sterling. Um, and it's similar levels exist across Europe. Under the regulation, it's proposed that the system of fining will be split into tiers, and those tiers will uh, max at uh, a percentage of global annual revenue. So the highest fine that we could see could be based on 2% uh, of global annual revenue. So the maths on that is as simple as it sounds. You know, if you are a business with a global annual revenue of $100 million, then you could expect a fine of up to $2 million. We may see some movement on that figure. Uh, there is also talk of that figure being um, uh, raised to 5%, but with a cap of 100 million euros. But whichever way you look at it, the fining uh, regime under the regulation will be far greater than what we have right now. So a lot to bear in mind in relation to data exports, but a lot to bear in mind in terms of what the regulation is likely to bring. And I know I've just very quickly cantered through some of those points. And if you want to um, listen in to previous webinars that we've recorded on the topic of data exports and also on the regulation, then please do have a look at uh, Taylor Westing's Global Data Hub uh, where you can still engage and access those particular webinars. But for now, I'll hand over to Paul. Hello, and thank you for, for, for listening to our webinar. We've slightly run over time. And we don't, we don't have any questions that have been pre-submitted. But needless to say, I hope you found that useful. And if you do have any questions, do feel free to email them through to us. As I say, this is the latest in our Mayor General Council webinar series. We will be having our next webinar in, in October. The date is to be finalized. And that's going to be covering confidential information, 
um, the enforceability of non-competes in the UK and non-solicitation and non-dealing provisions in the UK and the rest of Europe, where there is um, w where there are some very different rules to what you to what you may be used to. So everybody who's who's attended this seminar, our webinar, will in fact be invited to that one, and I hope you'll join us. As I say, I hope you find this useful, and thank you for joining us again.